one person simply asks, hey, have you heard about FPAs? Those are like analog FPGAs? Uh, that seems strange. Hey, look, there's that one professor from Georgia Tech. She might know something about it. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Are you sure? Hmm. Hey, Jennifer. Oh, no. Okay, we wanted to know more about FPA devices. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So FPGA devices are field programmable gate arrays. And basically it's routing and logic that are kind of connected together with a bunch of inputs and outputs. So field programmable analog arrays, or often talked about as large scale field programmable analog arrays, um, are kind of the sort of generalization of this, where I have now analog elements as well as logic and routing and I.O. to work with. So it's really the mixed signal equivalent of FPGAs. It's really kind of a neat concept that, that's been developed over the last several years. Hey, do you think you could review any of the FPGAs for us just so we can have a background? Sure. So FPGAs really are again, this combination of routing and logic and, and really are rather standard across a lot of different technologies these days. I mean, you have Xilinx, which now became AMD, and Altera, which is now part of Intel, um, have large number of chips. And one could look at a whole range of catalogs, and they're used in a whole range of spaces. They started in the 1980s and over the last 40 years have become an opportunity to do effectively approximate custom digital design and some other applications um, that you can reconfigure and change and be able to do this. It also has this wonderful opportunity that code is relatively compatible between devices. So you can run one thing on one device and move it to another device. So this gives you some great opportunities. And if you look at it closely, you're going to be talking about what is typically called uh, in Manhattan route routing, which is used in both of these structures. Um, which are typically going to be computational logic blocks, which have various lookup tables and, and, and SRAMs, and you have routing in between C blocks and S blocks, and very much like what you'd expect of these streets running in a big city like Manhattan in New York. Um, and with a few other interesting pieces in here in terms of some of the routing capability. But the big thing to notice is there is a lot of routing that enables all of this all of this capability in a digital device or in any sort of device of this sort. That, that issues then ends up having an issue in terms of latency, area, and energy that's required in the system. But even with that, these are huge, these are used everywhere, and the benefits are, are rather significant. So these FPAs, how did these come about? Good to always know the history. Well, it turns out that two FPA devices sort of seemed to start off in Southern California, um, sort of independently. Two individuals, Martin Brook and Massabilati, um, one at USC, one at Caltech, sort of talked about these uh, very basic FPA devices, which are basic was nothing more than a few computational blocks and routing infrastructure around it. <laughs> and you think, okay, that's kind of a neat idea for some SRAMs. And then you had people like Ed Lee, who did a whole bunch of additional work in that in the early 90s. And a lot of this, again, you have IO pins, you have SRAM switches, it works pretty well. Then there was a bunch of others in, in the 90s, and this kind of continued along. And so if you look at this, this looks really cool. Of course, you might say, well, hey, what else could be done? And there was a little bit of work that started this in Georgia Tech, and thinking of people both like Tyson Hall and Chris Twig, um, who were very much involved in FPGA development at the time, and kind of discussing, you know, I bet FPGAs, floating gates, would make good switches. And all of a sudden, hey, look, a chip popped out of that conversation after many, many months of hard work. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of different processes there. So some of you might be thinking, well, this is maybe just a few interesting academic exercises. <sighs> and then you're thinking, OK, is anything commercial? You think all interesting? Well, it turns out there have been some commercial attempts at this, uh, Anodyne being probably one of the most notable in the 90s. Uh, which is basically a whole bunch of switch capacitor components um, that are interconnected to various analog elements there that are all um, sort of programmed by digital SRAM elements. You do see some things out of Cypress, out of what is their PSOC part, and they still sell these today, which are mostly digital FPGAs with a little bit of analog in there. Um, very nice little parts there. 
Uh, you'll even see some aspects looked at for RF. I mean, uh, BAE has their matrix chip, which they you know started that around 2015 as part of a DARPA program, uh, which worked out well. You see people like Aspinity, uh, which came out of uh, West Virginia, where they're lab, you know, in the last five years or so, when looking at this, there's our, there are SRAM switches, although they actually have analog parameters in their system. And so there's these elements. There's there's probably some more as well, but these are these kind of fit this sort of CAVs and infrastructure routing concept. And then you think, okay, well, the solution could have been built with a few op amps or other discrete components. Eh. You think, well, Spinity looks a little bit different. It might be a little bit better. And you think, maybe. Let me guess, there's floating gates. Oh, thank you for reminding me to explain more about floating gates. I appreciate that. I need a drink. Okay. So what do we mean by floating gate devices or circuits? Well, these are typically going to be capacitive based circuits, which actually have a have a point that does not have a DC point to ground. And as a result of that, there's actually some additional charge, which is a free parameter. That can be done either in sort of a capacitive divider, be done in an op amp circuit, where really the resistors and inductors define the dynamics. And this just makes sense because so many things on chip are done with capacitors. It's great, but it does give me this wonderful storage opportunity. And you can actually program this charge by a number of means. We typically like to use at Georgia Tech the sort of combination of tunneling and injection where we use injection for precision measurements and also then to uh, decrease the floating gate charge and use electron tunneling as sort of an erasure mechanism. And this gives incredibly high precision. Um, and particularly important because you want to talk about do I have a voltage source or a current source? And these are the sort of key things you want to build all over different circuit elements. And it turns out this is completely possible in standard CMOS. This is some nice pictures that you might see how this would, would build out of a very traditional safe design. There's many ways to do this. Um, and this is really central to pretty much all of the Georgia Tech FPA family of technologies. Um, and so you might say, well, why are the floating gate important? Floating gate devices important? Well, let's just do a comparison. What's the other alternative? Well, I could have a DAC at every single device and set a current source. All right, that's great. So let's actually compare what the relative size is. And as soon as you start to plot out what is the number of parameters versus the area, you realize very quickly that DACs are going to take a lot of area. In fact, the more precision, it's going to take substantially more area. Whereas a floating gate element um, is significantly better. In fact, if you look closely, you know, you're definitely looking at you know, 100x or far better through this for just even comparing it against 6 to 8-bit DACs. And you think, well, well what's that going to look like? Well, 7-bit DAC, that means like, let's say, 1 volt floating gate range. Um, you know, LSB is about 10 millivolts. You realize that's about a 30% subthreshold current change, which is which is cool to have. That's already pretty coarse, but at least you need that much. If you don't have that, you've got a lot of problems. If you start talking about 12 bits, now we get into 1%, and that turns out to be really, really valuable in the subthreshold region as well as in the above threshold region, you get e even better accuracy, but it's a kind of a good sort of baseline measurement to work with. So it's very valuable there. And the other part is analog gets transformed through this programmability, because if I have like a transconductance capacitor design, which we know gives us sort of the lowest noise we're given bias current and the highest bandwidth and all the really efficient things we want, this is a great technology, except that it really needs programmability and linearity to really, and offset compensation to go anywhere. Well, it's cool is that that current source can actually set the differential pair. We're in great shape. It also then allows me to set um, set the offsets. It also allows me to then do things to set the linear range. So we're in a really good spot here with a technology that really can open it up. And so this is one of the things you see used in many of these approaches. So there's a lot more to this story. I can't, I can't wait. So then there's this question about granularity. And remember, we talked about having cabs and, 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 and elements. And we could have different routing topologies, like what you see with the FPGAs, which are often used. But in any of these cases, we run into this one interesting problem of, do we talk about a coarse grain or a fine grain granule, granular system? And you think, all right, what does that mean? Well, coarse grain means I'm going to have a whole bunch of blocks that are really fairly large blocks and a few switches in between them. Whereas fine grain granular, it's like I'm going to have the ability to get to transistors, but then only a few switches, and I'm going to have like lots of switches in between. Well, if I go to the fine grain one, I'm going to get a lot of switches. If I go to the coarse grain one, I'm not going to have too many switches, but I'll have some limitation. 
So in one case, I've got huge flexibility and gigantic routing cost. On the other case, I've got a lower routing cost, but I only get to choose from a menu of functions. This may seem like a bit of a limitation. And in these cases, in, in this approach, you think of yourself as switches really only a cost. They're in cost in area, they're cost in performance, and I really just want to minimize the effect of these switches. And so usually this is going to move you most times towards coarse grain architectures in these approaches, in, given this idea. And you're going to get the same question for FPGA architectures. You do some sort of mixture between the coarse and the fine grain to make these work, but the switches still limit your performance. So, but what we but what we need, even though FPGA is of course you know manage all these things for like lookup tables and get kind of a mixed grain, we really want fine grain capability with a less than typical coarse grain cost. So the switches are living, limiting everything. And this necessary fine grain configurability to really be a huge advantage doesn't look realistic. Okay, end of story, right? Well, let me share some other history for you. This might help. So, so if we go back to 2005 at Georgia Tech, there was this whole discussion around taking some FBA ICs and trying to build them for particular applications. And we want to say, well, how do I build some auditory filters and do other computational blocks? Well, it turned out that one way to approach this was to build some capacitive elements, use the GMC element to actually filter things, and then use a, a device at the very top to kind of set a low corner so that way I could get like some sort of DC biasing that's going to behave well in the structure, just given the way the chips were built at that time. And you think, okay, well, that's possible. And you're like, well, okay, that's great. And it feels a lot like other structures, like maybe an adaptive photoreceptor. And then you go, great, so now I can build this differentially. And I'm great. Where am I going to find this floating gate element? Oh, wait, there's one in the routing. In fact, right between those two points A and B. And I can program this to an analog value. So I bet this could happen. And the answer is, yep, it's possible. Do so you think, what else is possible? It turns out a long list, vector matrix multiplication, resistive network, on and on and on, to the point where you begin to realize most of the computation starts happening in the routing. This comes from a paper that, that we talk about, the switches are not dead weight, um, rather, rather well descriptive title for what we're actually trying to do here. Why is this important? Well, when you look at an FPGA, it's basically not just CLBs and routing, but a lot of additional elements like multipliers and coefficient RAMs and so forth. Well, with the FPAs, you don't do that because, after all, I've got a crossbar sitting in the routing, and that crossbar in the routing is a VMM or other aspects. So it allows me to compute through the switches and computing in memory. What makes this work is that I can do a single switch, a single floating gate element that I can program across all the analog space, and um, as well as it also turns out to keep all of that analog properties ready and available for me. Uh, nice theory. I mean, has anything been built out of this? Well, yes. In fact, we described a couple of things, but even more, there are some other things we can say. In fact, there's been almost 20 years of FPA development around this, and particularly over the last 15, as we've been using the routing fabric in different ways, we've allowed to really update how we think about routing. <clears throat> in the cab design itself, there's a huge amount of opportunity there as well. But most of it has actually kind of converged over time with multiple structures and realized, and with development co being done between the routing and the, the actual infrastructure. And there's been a whole bunch of neat applications here over the years. This is kind of a picture of the system on chip FPA I see, um, been used for doing uh, a whole range of things, including embedded machine learning, a whole bunch of acoustic processing, image processing, neural interfacing, security applications optimal path planning, and on and on. And as a result of it, it turns out that the sort of co-optimization allows uh, basically parameter densities that are at least a factor of a thousand more than almost any other kind of approach. And this is primarily of using the fine grain capability throughout these various infrastructures. Well, I bet these analog FPAs just won't scale. Well, actually, they kind of do, and so far, no problems yet. There's a whole lot more to continue to build in that space. Okay, well, even if you do that, then the tools are going to be a problem to build. Well, actually, it turns out there's tools, and you know, I'll, and I'm sure that with this open source format, it'll eventually get modified and changed over the years. But even for what we have, there's a graphical form that allows it to simulate, target, and design uh, all in one infrastructure. 
and that's been used by classes at Georgia Tech for years.